guys ready? Should we go? My name is Hani Elabet and I'm here to talk to you about real-time location tracking on mobile devices through my journey as I built the where's the right.com website and the where's the right mobile apps. A little bit of my background. I'm an engineer by training and I've been a computer programmer for the past 20 years. And these are some of the languages I've used in, pro in a production setting. The bulk of my experience is in Java, 10 years of Java programmer, and Ruby on Rails programmer since 2009, and JavaScript since 2010. I'm mainly a web developer. Server side is my strong point. And I've done plenty of client server in the old days, and client side JavaScript is fine. Lately, I've been working with JavaScript, Objective C on iOS, and Java again on uh, the Android devices. So, this is my journey as I worked on Where's the Ride. It started with my ex boss and friend who asked me to look into location tracking for school buses. And the mobile apps to support this so that the parent can see where the bus is and that this would be helpful when it's very cold, stormy, very hot. So it, it allows the parents to delay when they go to the bus stop to drop off their kids. So if you know where, where the bus is, then you can just few minutes before the bus shows up at the bus stop, go run to the bus stop and drop off your kids. Same thing is true for picking up your kids. So that was, that was how we started, and, and hence the name. Oops. We went out of play mode. Okay, let's try this. Okay, so the big picture is that we have a... GPS locator on the bus that would be posting a location record to a server and then that we push the data back to be viewed on a mobile device, tablet, or a desktop computer. So I asked, how hard can it be? <laughs> All you have to do is get yourself a gizmo, a GPS, uh, a, G a GPS a receiver that also happens to have a cellular network radio and the server side is going to be your vanilla Nginx Rails Postgres and the mobile apps that would be needed on the client side you know, whether we have uh, the, a mobile app on the Android iOS and Windows Phone and Blackberry so I reasoned this is all what we need to do. It's not rocket science. It's, it's definitely not revolutionary. It's evolutionary. So. so as we looked into, as we researched the different gizmos available for GPS tracking, and there's plenty of them, and they're available, and they come with uh, radio, uh, cellular radio. Uh, so, so you can get a gizmo that has a, GPS tracker as well as the cellular radio, radio. We researched the cellular solutions available for such a system. So if you grab this gizmo and put it on a bus, you would need to talk to your cellular provided, providers like Verizon, AT&T. And we realized this is massive. For every school district, you're going to have to go and negotiate deals with these, uh, with these cellular network providers. And then we, we started looking into 
the market for this specific usage of, of the location tracking. And we weren't sure if school district were interested in it. We knew that the parents may be interested in it, but for this to translate, for them to go to their school board and make it happen, we weren't sure that that was going to happen. So we said, why build a market-specific solution? Why not build a solution, a generic solution, for usage by the masses? So we, we decided that this is what we're going to work on. We're going to work on an affordable real-time location tracking for friends and family and for anything of value that moves that you can attach a gizmo or a smartphone to. So we're, we're generalizing it. We're let you, letting you, the user, decide what you want to use this for. We can always specialize back again for school buses and sailboats. But for now, we're going to, make, we're going to generalize it and make it for the, for the masses. Now, we know others, big companies and small, have built similar s solutions to this. So we threw away the, the uh, traditional wisdom of researching the market, checking out your competition, see how they're doing it. We didn't want to be influenced by any of their solution. We wanted to grow it organically from within. We basically wanted to have a solution for doing real-time location tracking for friends and family, and then we realized that we can specialize it in the future. So we switched from the bus and the gizmo, sending the, the, the location record to the server, and then having the parent consume it. We switched to friends and family and a mobile device. And it, it could be a mobile phone or a tablet with, uh, with a cellular receiver and a GPS tracker. So these, these devices could, could have a, would, would run our app and the app would, it would allow, we would allow the, the, the friends and family to turn on the tracker and the tracker would post the date. Ah, we went up. Sorry about that again. So the, the, the tracker in our mobile app would post the data to the server and the server would push it back to the viewer, and the viewer could be another phone, another tablet, or a desktop um, computer. And the reverse is true. So if you're viewing where your friends are, you can, you're using our apps, you can, you can turn the tracker on, and suddenly you're, you're sending your location data and, to be viewed by others. Now, it doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. It could be many-to-many, -many. so the, the friending principle. So. First, a quick disclaimer. Everything in here is work in progress. It's an ugly duckling. It's very rough around the edges. And for now, we only have iOS and Android support. This demo app um, runs a tracker on an iOS simulator. And we have a viewer. So, so the app always has a viewer and a tracker in it. So we're going to have another simulator, an Android simulator, running the viewer. And I'm using simulators here just to show you a quick tour of the application. Now, the, again, another disclaimer, the application is by no means... Uh... Thank you. Oh, geez, sorry. The application is not finished. It's work in progress. So let's go ahead and see. Let me see. Is it running? All right, now it's running. So on the right-hand side, we have uh, an iOS 6.1 simulator with a three and a half inch iPhone. And on the left-hand side, we have an Android Nexus One running the KitKat operating system, uh, Android 4.4 operating system. So, so the idea is, I'm, uh, I'm doing it this way because the iOS has some good tools for that would support the location, location tracking, and, and I'm going to talk about those in a second. So this is the app. It's simple, three tabs, uh, the settings, 
for uh, turning on the tracker. Now the tracker on this one happens to be on because previously I had left it on. This is the viewer. When you click on the map button, you get the viewer. And the last location record was Apple head headquarters in Cupertino. And this is friends and family where you manage your relationship for adding, removing, what have you. The setting also allows you to turn the tracker on, so it could be in an always on, or you can say, hey, I want to I want to give my friends, I want to let them track my, my location for the next few hours. So you can say, hey, let's do time-restricted location tracking, and then you can say, I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to the movie, and we're meeting somewhere, so everybody's going to turn on their tracker, and I'm going to give them, I'm going to let them track my position for the next five hours and maybe if you have a longer trip for the next two days and five hours or you can schedule it for sometimes in the future and of course you can have many of those events we don't have that yet so in this case we're going to schedule an event starting on june 10th at around noon and ending on june 13 at around noon For now, I'm just going to go ahead and, and turn the tracker on, always on. And this, this information here is just for debugging purposes. In the, final, in the final product, of course, it won't be there. So I, I'm running the viewer. So we're, we have a tracker sending information to the server and the server pushing it back to the viewer and we're in Cupertino, California. Now this is the tool I told you about. So we're, we're in the iOS simulator and I can ask iOS to inject fake data, if you will, into the, the simulator and it's as if I'm going to be, it's as if the simulator is driving down a California highway. So this is, this is excellent because for programmers who are doing location programming, all you have to do is ask Iowa, the iOS simulator, hey, give me a ride down the driveway or give me a bicycle ride or a run. So they, they covered the three bases. So this is, the, the iOS is, has the tracker on and it's viewing itself. So the iOS is traveling down the highway and they happen to be viewing themselves. On the Android side, it's exactly the same application, looks exactly like the other one, behaves exactly the same. And for the Android side, we're gonna go ahead and, and fire up the, the viewer. We're not gonna turn on the tracker. So, so the, the Android per person is sitting and watching uh, the iOS iPhone, I suppose, dr driving down the highway. So this is real time. This is this is somebody at Apple who took their phone and recorded those location records and created a file out of it. So just wanted to give you an idea, a, a quick tour of the app. So back to my journey. Um, to to get where we where we are to get to this demo stage. Being a web developer, I'm always comfortable with with the, working with web tools. So I said, for now, let's go ahead and forget the mobile app. So let's forget the the phones, the tablets. Let me try to get the server side portion running uh, working. So the idea is, we need uh, we need a way to get a web page to send location record to a server. And that's very easily done. It's a post. You, all you have to do is create a web page where you, you're posting location record to a server. No problem here. The problem is pushing data from the server to the viewer or the many viewers in real time. 
So there are many ways to push data from the server to the client. Shameful way, my first way of doing it is polling. So the client, basically, the moment we have a viewer running, the client says, hey, do you have any data for me? The server says no. Sleeps for five seconds, for 10 seconds. And the client wakes up, says, hey, do you have more data for me? And pretty soon, you realize this is very wasteful of server, server resources as well as bandwidth. It's not scalable. And try doing any meaningful work by looking at the logs, because the, the logs are always scrolling up. So I very quickly wanted to get rid of this solution. Another solution is log polling. So the idea here is the client sends a request to the server. The server, if it doesn't have any data to send back to the client, it holds on to the request. It blocks. And when data becomes available, the server releases the block and return with a response to the client. The client consumes the data and immediately fires another request to the server and the server blocks again and so forth. Now, to do this and to do any, any kind of real-time programming, your proxy server, your load balancer, or any of your servers between the server handling request and the client, you need to adjust them to allow for long running queries. Ilya Grigorik of Google fame has a great book, High Performance Browser Networking. It was published late last year, but there's a second printing at early, early this year. And on the left-hand side, he shows polling. And if you can see, if a server has an update, a location update from, from the tracker, and the location update happens to be here, whereas your, your polling and the polling interval is five seconds, there's that big, huge delay in here. And I tried that. And my polling interval was 10 seconds, and the application didn't look responsive at all. So I lowered it to five seconds. And then you realize, this is crazy. This is this is definitely not a good thing to do. This is long polling. On the, on the right-hand side, we have long polling. And the idea is the server holds on to the request. It doesn't return a response. When a location record is available from the tracker, it releases, returns the response, and the client immediately fires up another request, and the server blocks the other request. So this is called long polling. It's also known as comment. Some people call it Ajax push or push Ajax. Another solution is server sent events. So again, we're, we're trying to solve the problem of real-time communication, having the server push to the client. So this solution, server sent event, is the client establishes a stringing connection between it and the server. The server keeps the connection open and whenever it has data, it pushes to the client. And the server never breaks that connection. It's the client, when the client is done with the server, the client ends the connection, and the server ends it then. When I was, wor when I was working, oh, 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 one more thing. This is not compatible with old browsers. And you have to have a newer server. So if let's say your server doesn't have server set, sent event, then you may have to find some solution for it. The server I was working with did not have server sent event, so I had to switch to a different server. And then the framework, the Rails framework, had just started supporting the server sent event. And my solution was working. I was happy until I realized that all the incoming requests, all, all the viewers were sending requests to the controller, and the controller was, was creating a service sent event um, situation. And for each one of those, it was grabbing a database connection, whether a database connection was needed or not. So I started reasoning, if I'm going to have a 1,000 users, a 1,000 viewer, that means we're, we're grabbing a 1,000 connection out of the connection pool. 
So immediately I'm like, oh, I gotta find something else. Sorry about that. So this is this is my implementation of server set event. I'm not gonna spend much time on it. In here, this is the fallback. If the browser doesn't support server set event, I just told you don't use polling, and here I am using polling. I just wanted to get something done and and IE6789 don't support uh, server-side events. So I, I'm like, I'll, 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 I'll have another polyfill in the future, but for now, not worry about it. So this is server sent event. If your browser supports it, you instantiate an event source, and you, re you handle the unopen, on error, and on message. And you can also add your own event. So in my case, I, uh, the server was, I was creating a new location event on the server, and the way I was handling it, I was grabbing the data, converting it from JSON to uh, JavaScript, and I'm placing the bus on the map or moving the bus on the map. WebSockets is another technology. There's plenty of literature out there about it. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about it except for the fact that it would have worked for me except for this. 86% of the Android browsers, so 86% of the Android market, as far as I'm concerned, does not have WebSocket support. The latest one, the KitKat OS, uh, supports it. But, so for me, WebSockets were dead, as far as I'm concerned, for, the, for this usage. This is the, uh, this is, as of June of 2014, this is the, 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 the the, the, the devices in the market. So for iOS, about 90% the, the existing devices are using iOS 7 and 9% iOS 6, so no problem there. And on the Android side, you can see, uh, I don't know if any of you heard the um, keynote address uh, at the Apple Worldwide Developers Conference. Uh, one of the speakers there called this a talk six two of Android defragmentation. So <laughs> I just thought that was funny. Talk six two. So again it's with sweet stew. <laughs> it is a sweet stew. So again back to Ilya's book, uh, High Performance Browser Networking. Uh, he has a, a nice diagram about polling. You know, we said don't use polling, it's horrible. This is SSE events, service sent events or event source. The, the client establish a connection, and then they handshake, and from now on, the server pushes the data. And then later on, the client severs the connection, and off we go. On the WebSocket side, you know, they, they establish the connection, do the handshake, and they can go back and forth. So what to do for real-time communication between the server and client? You know, WebSocket is easy, but it's not fully compatible. Lone polling is compatible with all browsers, but it has a challenging server-side component because you have, to, you have to create some kind of queue to a, a blocking queue, meaning, hey, I don't have any more data for you, so incoming request has to be blocked, has to be held on to. SSE server sent event is dead on arrival because I was using rail, and of course, polling is wasteful and not scale. So one solution is what if we can use WebSockets when available, when supported by the browser, and long polling as a fallback? So I started looking into this, and I'm like, am I the only one who wants to do this? Sure enough, other people have implemented this as early as 2009. There's, uh, the Dojo Foundation has a protocol called the Bayeux Protocol, I'm trying to pronounce it the French way. Uh, and James Coughlin, bless his heart, has implemented a face server. And the next three bullets here, oh, sorry. These three bullets I've picked up from their documentation. So the BioPurkle and the phase server's implementation of it is responsible for serializing and deserializing messages as JSON over flavors of HTTP transport. That's good. Persistent connection using WebSocket. That's good. Long polling via HTTP post. This is exactly what I was looking for. 
So the, my final server solution is this. So we have a location tracker on a mobile device going through Nginx at the front, passing information to Rails, Rails persisted on a Postgres database, and at the same time, passes on the request to a Faye real-time server, Faye sends it back through Nginx, and it gets pushed back to the viewer, to anybody who, who's viewing the, lo the location, and it could be another viewer on a desktop, as many viewers are as are viewing. So the real-time server maintains a persistent connection with all viewers. So say we have a thousand simultaneous connection, that means the face server is gonna keep a thousand connection open and ditto with the Nginx um, server. Oops. Sorry about that again. So, oops, I gotta go through this. So one, one question that people may ask, what do you do? What do you do once you run out of connection on the face server on the Nginx? Well, you put in more face servers, <laughs> more yeah. Nginx. The, the, from my readings, it's a 10,000 connection limit. So even though you, uh, TCP IP allows you 65,000 ports, nobody has been able to go past 10,000, 13,000, so I figured I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. So, so this is the tool I've used. On the right-hand side, there is a tool. Uh, on the right-hand side is a web page that I've created. And the idea is I don't have the mobile app up and running yet. So let me create this web tool that allows me to simulate location records. So the idea is I'm going to click on the map, and I'm going to post the, I'm going to act as a tracker, post the location record to the server, and the server pushes it back to the viewer. This is, this is the, the current solution. As you can see, it's very fluid, it's very smooth. This is, this is a server post, bring it back, doing a move on a, move, on a Google map. And of course, when you're uh, simulating stuff, you can run on people's lawns, you can go on top of buildings and what have you. So you get the idea. These are the links for the face server and the Bayou protocol. All you have to do is Google Bayou, Bayou protocol and face server. Now, James Coughlin had implemented the, the Bayou protocol for Ruby using Rack and for Node.js. So there's two servers that implement the Bayou protocol. So my wife is very gracious to let me use her as my first tester. So I took her iPhone, installed my app on it, and it's an iPhone 4S running iOS 7.1, and the demo has an Android, Android simulator, another iOS simulator, and the desktop web page. So I found out that day that my wife was, about, was, just, was just about to leave work. So I ran on my, I hurried to my iMac, I fired up a browser. I fired up an iOS simulator with a four-inch retina display. That's why the, the, the screen, the, the size of the phone is so huge, because it's a four-inch retina display. And this time, the iOS is running, uh, it's running iOS 7.1. And on the left-hand side, we have an, the same Android running the Nexus One with KitKat. Now, to make it interesting, I speeded it up by 20 times. So the recording part, only you know, the viewing part just to, to make it go fast. Every now and then you're going to notice that there are pauses. So pauses are traffic jams or lights. So you can see as, as she's heading towards the, um, the belt line, there's going to be a pause and that's a traffic light. It's a traffic light. <coughs> Suspense is killing me. <laughs> so the the middle screen is a web browser again and this is iOS viewer and this is the Android viewer. Oops. We have to pause. Oh, what just happened? Holy moly. Did we lose? We lost something.
lost the big monitor. I wonder why. Is it back? Yeah. Okay, she's driving down M, Highway M. Lots of traffic jams on Highway M. Still running. It's just a really bad traffic jam. <laughs> Well, we've speeded it up by 20 times, so... <laughs> well... Yeah, let me see if I can take it... Yeah, I can interrupt. And... Okay, this is M. So she's going down M, and you can see there's traffic. There's a light in there. So she's in Verona now, so we live in Verona, she's entering Verona, and pretty soon, to my surprise, wife decides to stop at uh, Walgreens. So I zoomed in, I, I stopped what I was doing and zoomed in, and very politely enough, the bus stays outside, it doesn't go to Walgreens. So this is the elapsed time here, every few seconds it goes, so five Minutes, so the wife spends uh, 10 minutes at Walgreens. And then she heads home. So um, no need for suspense. It's <laughs> <laughs> That's good for you. Yeah, the, the bus uh, goes on top of Walgreens. So this is an iOS location tracker running on the um, iOS 7.1, and it's an iPhone 4S. So she leaves Walgreen, heads home, and as she gets closer to the house, I zoom in again. I go to the maximum zoom. On the left-hand side here, if you're zoomed in too much, the Google Map cannot feed you with enough data, so, so you get those blank, uh, blank screen. This is what I wanted to show you, but don't zoom in too much. So we're at home. So now that we've got the server component working, uh, Let's forget about the web app. Let's focus on the mobile apps. So the mobile app needs to track location in real time. The tracker needs to be fire and forget. So we, when I installed the, the app on my wife's iPhone, I installed it, I turned it on, pushed the home button, the app is running in the background, and we never touched it anymore. The viewer needs to show location to friends and family in real time. This, this app is useless if we can't do things in real time. We need to minimize battery consumption. If, if your app is a battery hog, your users are going to uninstall it, and you lost clients. It needs to run on iOS, Android, and others. The priorities were, again, I'm repeating myself a little bit here, need to minimize battery consumption, but also cellular data consumption. So you have to think about the, those, those tracker pack location records that you're sending to the server. have to think through, how can I economize on that, that packet of information I'm sending to the server? You need to survive the atrocious mobile app lifecycle. Life so a lot of us are mobile web developers here. And uh, I'm sorry, a lot of us are web developers. And we've never had to worry about your app about, about battery consumption, about your app going to the background, on pause, on resume. So on, the, um, on a mobile app, your app can and will be killed at any time by the, by the mobile OS. Uh, so you, you have to continue your tracker. If, if the user requested the tracker is on, your app needs to continue tracking location even after being killed. So the, I had to wrap my head around it. That's so like, my app is getting killed. What do I have to do? So there are, there are tricks here. So what to do when your app is killed? Just before your app gets killed, you politely ask the mobile OS to give you some attention when location has changed. And you tell the mobile uh, OS that, hey, I'd like to run a little bit whenever your location changed. You can't run a lot. 
You have a very small window of time. On iOS, you register to monitor for regions and significant lo location changes, and you register this with core location. On Android, you register as a service to be the target of a pending intent. And then you pass the pending intent to Android when you request location updates. So Xamarin. Xamarin is a corporation started, one of the people started it is Mi Miguel de Ecaza. I hope I'm pronouncing his, his name correct. Mi Miguel de Ecaza started the Mono project. Mono allowed Linux, Linux and Unix developers to use the Microsoft.NET framework on Unix, on Unix and Linux. And he is very famous. He is one of the creator of GNOME on the Linux world, and Mono and Xamarin. Now for Xamarin, he and his team have created a platform by which they allow they allow you to write for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone using the C-sharp language and a little bit of the .NET framework. And um, they happen to have an excellent documentation about guides, what to do. I, I'm trying to write a location app. What, what, how, what do I do? I've never found anywhere this, anything this close. So out of respect for the Xamarin people, if, if this presentation, again, we're, we're taping it, we're going to put it on YouTube. If this presentation ever makes it to the Xamarin people, I, buy, I bow down in respect to all of you people at Xamarin. This, this uh, documentation is excellent. So on iOS 6, oh, oh. running out of battery. That's okay. So on iOS 6, we, we're building a location app. So I registered for my, uh, my, my app needs, uh, is a background necessary app. On iOS 7, again, it's a background necessary. The red arrows, I've added the red arrows to guide us down here. So it is a, it is a location app. I'm registering with iOS as a background necessary app. And am I tracking user location? Yes. Where am I here? Do you need precise update? Yes. So use region monitoring. And do you have a cell radio? Yes. So use significant location changes. On the Android side, you have two options. You can have a remote service or a local service. The difference is that a local service resides within the same process as your application. A remote service resides in a different process. So I decided to go for a remote service. The reason being is that if I can take the code that grabs the GPS data and send the data to the server, that very tight code, and I can put it in a service by itself, cost is four megabytes of RAM, and I can keep my 40 meg app all by itself. When it comes time to being killed, the OS would probably kill my application but leave my service. So the probability is higher if you have a really tight, couple, tightly coupled, um, tight, tight code, four megs of RAM, no big whoop. Now, to talk, to talk between the app, and your service. You have two options. You can use Service Messenger, or you can use something that they've taken from Cobra. Anybody remember Cobra? Corba, Corba, I'm sorry, Corba. Corba or uh, Com, Microsoft C-O-M. You remember that. Oh, yeah. So I decided to avoid um, the Android uh, interface definition language. In a nutshell, you're basically they didn't have XML, they didn't have JSON back then, and they wanted a platform neutral way of talking back and forth. In the old days of Corba, Corba you, you wrote the classes so that the framework can ser ser serialize and deserialize, and can marshal and marshal them. All right. So 
the first demo, we had a location tracker running in software. So we, we had uh, an iOS 6.1 iPhone running in the simulator, and we're, we're injecting fictitious location. In the second demo, I had my wife with her iPhone uh, 4S running iOS 7.1. This demo is me walking my dog around the neighborhood and using my very old uh, Droid 2, uh, Motorola Droid 2 and the Android 2.3 Gingerbread uh, OS. See if it's running. Did I push the button? Is it running? Okay, now it's running. So I grabbed my phone, my Droid 2 phone, I launched the application, I put it in the background, and I dimmed the screen, put the phone to sleep, put it in my back pocket, wrapped the harness around my dog, and off we go. We left the house, and uh, you can see that in a second. The, this demo, I speeded it up by six times. My wife demo, I speeded it up by 20 times. And the first demo, it was real time. So as we get towards the corner, my dog decide, my dog Lily decide to do her business. So I back up a little bit to pick up the poop. <laughs> and waiting and waiting, picking up the poop. And off we go. So we're going around the block. And as we reach here, my, log, my dog Lily decided to do her other business. So we pause a little bit. And eventually we go towards the, the corner. I stop and talk to my, boss, uh, to my um, neighbor. And then we head towards uh, the house, and then we, grow, we go through the backyard, and in the corner here, there's a poop bucket. I dump the poop in the bucket, and then I go around the house, and as I head towards my driveway, I stop, and I pick up the mail, picking up the mail, and I head back towards the house, and I drop off my dog, and then I grab my cell phone from my back pocket, and I launch the task manager on Android, and I kill my application. And I dim the screen, put it to sleep, put it back in my back pocket, and I walk out of the house. So my application is killed, is dead, because I killed it myself. And as I walk out of the house, Android wakes up and says, hey, you just changed your location. It's, it passed all the information to my service. So I reach the end of the block, I do a U-turn, and I head home. And again, I'm recording. I don't know if this has happened or not. I'm recording everything on my computer, so I have to go check it out and see if it's working. So you get the idea. This is Lily. The dog has been helping me a lot with my uh, testing. This is me <laughs> with a poop bag, cell phone, and Lily. And the message here is never miss an opportunity to test your app. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so any questions? Sure. So you just demoed um, from Android, and you had pretty awesome granularity as far as um, updates happening very quickly. Um, I have heard that. Well, iOS is much more restrictive about when you can background a process and how long that process will run for. And I recognize that they will allow you to do um, background processing of location updates. So I'm just curious if the interval updates that you get from iOS are as good as what you get from Android because they seem to be far more restrictive on iOS. They're wonderful. On the iOS side, their main focus is privacy again and battery and uh, battery preservation. So they, they're they doing, and, and I can see this from the logs. So one thing I've learned very quickly is 
that I had to put logs on both apps. So when, when things don't work, go through the log and figure out what's happening. Within 10 minutes after my wife gets to work, my app goes to sleep. And a little bit as soon as she drives out of the driveway, it, it, uh, my app gets location. So to answer your question is, I personally think location updates on the, on the iPhone are better than on the Android. Now granted, it's not fair because I haven't gone out of the Android 2.3 world. Um, KitKat, KitKat probably has better. They, now the, the, the Android people um, did a great job porting back any location um, framework they have back to 2.3. And the way they do it is on top of the Google Play service, the, um, Google Play service, yeah, Google Play service. So, so the idea is uh, they update the Play service, and you get the latest location framework. Did, did I answer your question? Or? Yeah. 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 So I, I, I think I thought that the while it's very restrictive on the on the iOS side, and it's hard to get wrap your head, head around it, and I. I spent hours and hours watching the video, uh, the videos, the World War WWW, WWDC uh, videos from 212, 213, iOS 6, iOS 7. I even watched the iOS 8 uh, videos. Um, it wasn't until I got to Xamarin, you know, I stumbled on the Xamarin guides. I'm like, wow, yeah, that's, that's what my brain pieced together from watching um, all those videos going to Stack Overflow, you know, the site, because Stack Overflow has information from two, you know, 2009 to 2010. So I had to, is this, is this relevant anymore? So, but Xamarin, the, the documentation in Xamarin was, was perfect. Any other questions? I guess I'm new to comments, so um, this may just be a naive question to start with. Sure. But, um, did you look into potentially um, caching requests to uh, minimize the database connections? So, uh, I mean, obviously there exists the possibility that five years down the road when um, everybody's using this app for every geolocation tracking, you'd have over 10,000 connections with unique different um, points being tracked, but if you have fewer than that, then you could have multiple people requesting the same update, only tying up one database connection. So. The database, my, my plan is to segregate this guy completely. So, so the communication between Rails, Postgres, and, and Fate. So, so these guys here, the real time, the real time system, I'm hoping to segregate it keep it by itself. And I would use messaging between Rails and Fate. Now, as you said, what do you do? You don't need many database connections for now. Ten, the, the average connection pool is 10 to 100 because uh, you, you write, you write, you try to write fast SQL, so things happen really fast. But, you know, the business of scaling Postgres is a difficult one. And I'm, I am going to have to agonize. Do I scale it, shard it? Do I shard it basically? Do I use a random key? Say, hey, we'll flip the coin. Whatever key you have, go to this server. Whatever key you have, go to the server. And then you do some replication too. If I start going down that path and doing it with Postgres, why not put Cassandra in there? <laughs> why, why not put React in there? Because they, they do this out of the box. So I haven't crossed that bridge. But, but that, I'm not worried about the 10,000 connection or 100,000 connection here because these guys could be scaled. I could have 10 face servers. So 10 face servers is, is 100,000 simultaneous connection. But the probability of having all those people viewing where the friends are at the same time is not very high, correct? So you, you're going to have a million... I'm just guessing here, just by the seat of my pants. So you can have a million customer before you need a hundred thousand 
simultaneous connection. 100,000 simultaneous connection is not hard. 10 phase server, few engine X, off you go. And as far as Postgres, um, it, it's amazing how powerful Postgres is. Um, I can batch the inserts. I can say, remember, the request is coming from the tracker, and I don't have to wait for the insert. I immediately push it back, and I can hold on to 10, 20, 100 <coughs> location record at a time, push them in one batch. That's what people do. Right. Is it, was that the Did I answer your question? Yeah, more or less. Um, I guess I didn't understand the, your intention to completely separate the real time from the, to some degree, you, argument, you have I to. Guess. You have to separate it. And, and I'm, I mean, you remember how I had server send events? Server send events would have had to be built within the, the confine of Rails, so it, it would have been here. I hated that solution. I, I, I did it because, hey, it's new. It's, as of 2013, people had server send event. Let me use it. And I felt it felt wrong. So. Since this is a JavaScript meetup, I would mention that uh, if you do the back end in Node.js, you can bundle all of that together because there's libraries like Sakadeo and a number of other ones. Sakadeo is one I've been using for like three years, but basically you can create an API server and a, a web socket slash long polling push server and it'll also fall down to um, polling, like interval based polling if you need to. So there are other things that do it very, very well. I did research that. I did. Um, and I, I agonized. The, James Coughlin has two implementation of Fay, one for Node.js and one for um, Rack, the Rack middleware for Ruby. I was a little bit more familiar with the Rack middleware. Granted, this is a Mad.js meeting, but I, I decided, you know, in the future, I may even drop Fay altogether and go to something true and trusty, something that I'm very strong and familiar with. I've done long polling in Java. Java is very reliable, very, the garbage collector is second to none. So if if start getting, and again, this, the Fay server right now is running um, Ruby 2.1, the um, M MRI, Matt's Ruby 2.1. Uh, I'm sorry, Matt's Ruby 2.0. And I don't like it because their garbage collector is bad. So this is on the back of my mind. Bad garbage collector here. Ruby 2.1 is way better than Ruby 2.0. So I'm itching to upgrade here. Another thing is, uh, another technology I'm itching to use on the server side is something called Docker. Anybody heard of Docker? D-O-C-K-E-R. The idea is separate, separate your server into small stuff, into containers, and you can uh, you can uh, put, push those containers away, replicate them very easily, and you can scale better this way. I haven't gotten there yet. Any more questions? Yeah. I just want to make an announcement. If anybody wants to get beer after this, Pause Club is open, even though it's a Monday, and they won't be busy. And then uh, as a second point, I'm still looking for more JavaScript developers. I work for Interactive Intelligence and posted on the mailing list about a week ago. Um, so if anybody is interested, uh, you know, come grab a card for me before or meet me over at Pause Club. There you go. Thank you for coming, and thanks, thanks to Flexion for the pizza. Um, there were email going back and forth, who's going to provide the pizza? We don't have any sponsors, so... There's no pizza left, so... Oh, excellent. I'm going to take you up on that.